eh, utrojen i Sala Chanceler, eftersom det inte är Jesse Jan Ursles, Kuludar Nehelskler, en Kedalchias, Tofirken och Sarum Fenja, är en Okotov och Tokshaks, Mille Buikes har sagt, en Firken Folche där i Shivrum Hain, i Srevma van Kela. Dear President and Vice Chancellor, Deputy Lieutenant, Minister, Honorary Consul, Distinguished Guests, and Community of the University, may I begin by uh, thanking you all for the very warm welcome that you have given to Sabina and I. And may I thank you, Minister, for your warm introduction. I am honoured to join you all today to deliver the sixth Harry Halkery Lecture. And may I begin by commending Queen's University and the Finnish Embassy in London for their collaboration in what is a very important lecture series. There could be no more appropriate way of remembering Harry Halkery, a good friend of these islands, as you have heard, and a man of peace, than to consecrate a moment of time each year in his memory to a, a reflection on the resolution of conflict. And there could be no more appropriate organiser for such an event than the Senator George J. Mitchell Institute for Global Peace and Security and Justice, an institute which carries the name of another great peacemaker and friend of Ireland who worked so closely with Harry and with General John de Chastelin to help to bring the gift of peace to our islands. And to this distinguished triumvirate, Harry brought his characteristic wit, intellect, considerable political wisdom, and indeed patience accumulated over many years of service in his native Finland. His memory will always remain near to the hearts of all those who sought and who continue to seek an enduring peace, not only on our own islands, but in other places too. For me it's a pleasure to come back to university at any time, but to particularly to return to Queen's University again. I have very fond memories of working with distinguished colleagues from this university during my time as a practicing university teacher. And of course, in more recent times, when I was asked to address an international meeting of the Institute of Conflict Transformation and Social Justice held here just four years ago. Since its foundation 170 years ago, Queen's University has been an important place of learning, not only for Belfast and Ireland, uh, but I think internationally, and it continues to uphold this tradition of scholarship to this day. And I think universities are so important. Our future on these islands and on this planet a fragile planet, depends in a very significant measure on the quality of courageous reflection we bring to present circumstances. And not just present circumstances, but anticipated futures. And this in turn depends inter alia on the teaching, learning and scholarly endeavour that is being carried out in places of reflection in universities. For it is in places of learning such as this that old and sometimes stale and even damaging orthodoxies can be challenged. It is in universities that long-held assumptions can be put to the test, even overturned. And it is in institutions such as this that the pluralist intellectual work that can generate policy for the future will be forged whether it be in the social sciences, the natural sciences, or the humanities. None of this pluralism can be taken for granted. There are times when it needs to be reasserted, reintroduced even. And this university, perhaps more than any others, is aware of how together, with the extraordinary opportunities that are given to teachers and students, comes a concomitant duty to transform knowledge and thought into positive action. After all, Queen's University shares the motto of the city of Belfast, pro tanto quid retibuamos, for so much, what shall we give back? 
And this lecture series then is very much in that spirit. And I am aware in making this address this morning that I'm following the footsteps of very distinguished speakers. Tarka Halonen, a former president of Finland, First Minister Arlen Forster, Ambassador Akbaras Ahmad, Senator Mitchell, and of course my friend of many years, Marti Atasari, whose commitment to peace has been truly global. All of these previous speakers have taken as their departure point the continuing task of pursuing peace, a reminder, if any were needed, that peace is a process, not an event, one that requires persistent and dedicated attention and effort. In such a process, words are, as Vaslav Havel memorably told us, important. Words that can wound, words that can heal, words that can create fear, words that can be emancipatory. And in such a circumstance, while we can draw on reason and intellectual services for acuity, it is necessary, I suggest, for us also to summon the very best of our moral, even healing instincts, as we attempt to choose our words carefully and with precision. However, these chambers from which words come include their own challenge, their echoes, what and how to remember, the content of collective memory, its use and abuse, and perhaps even the need for what Ulrich Beck has called a necessary ambivalence about the past. This occasion today, in this the 20th year since the Good Friday Agreement, provides me with an opportunity to offer some personal reflections on our own shared history on these islands in all its complexity and diversity and challenges. And as we continue in contemporary times with our efforts to take the text of the agreement, seeking to make of it a living practice of peace and reconciliation, I would like to reflect on a number of concepts which I believe are vital to that effort. Remembering, forgiving, forgetting and imagining. These are the concepts that I addressed at this university four years ago and to which I returned when I spoke on the task of ethical remembering at the Glyn Creek Centre for Peace and Reconciliation in 2015, and again at the Corimilo community in 2016. And so perhaps it is appropriate that it is to Queen's University that I come back again to offer some further reflections, even revision, to close the circle, as it were, or put another way, to move along the gyre. In speaking of remembering and forgetting, I am aware that I am speaking in university with a long tradition in the t teaching of, for example, Irish history. It is sometimes forgotten that it was a most distinguished professor of history at this university, James E.D. Todd, who laid the groundworks for a renaissance in the writing of Irish history one that interrogated many of the assumptions of what was often thought of, but frequently referred to, as the nationalist canon. Some of James E.D. Todd's students would go on to play a very important role in what his most famous protege, T.W. Moody, would later call the demythologization of Irish history. One does not have to be entirely sympathetic to that particular revisionist perspective proposed by that school of historiographical thought to recognise that it was an important scholarly endeavour, important not only as a contribution to the study of history, but important because in its earliest origins it demonstrates that Irish history in its totality was taken seriously here in Queen's in the 1930s, only a decade after partition. Now, of course, revisionism is valuable, and a wider revision was and is necessary, one that, for example, includes empire as well as nation, and the interaction of both. 
And recently I've been speaking in Europe about the challenges that European nations face, some of the largest and strongest, and not being able to unravel the sleeve of history that is their historical experience of empire. But later here in Queens, there would be a great tradition of economic and social history associated with such diverse figures as Ken Connell, uh, Robert Collinson Black, and of course my friend Lord Bew, whose works I've had occasion to consult and to cite throughout my career as an academic and as a politician. Indeed, Paul and I shared lecture circuits in 1979 when we spoke of Michael Davitt, land, politics and people in the west of Ireland in the late 19th century, both of us seeking to introduce a social and class dimension to the understanding of that period of Irish history. So I should say too in this academic setting that James E. D. Todd might have found it difficult uh, to be, have been a, to be elevated to the position of professor in the modern age of university metrics. He was primarily a teacher, one who was so beloved of generations of undergraduates that Sir David Keir, a former vice chancellor, would refer to him as that great teacher, that kindly guide to so many. And universities come out of a long tradition of disputatio and respect for thought and discourse long before the knee being bent to metrics or its tyranny. At a time when institutes of higher learning across the world are coming under ever more pressure from funding authorities, whether public or private, we should not lose sight of the vital purpose of the university. It is the teaching, its quality, the effort of the teacher that is remembered by graduates long after they have left and embarked on their own paths, when they make recollection and remember. Continuing with matters historiographical, we on this island are sometimes told that our history is something from which we must be emancipated, and by implication that the study of our history is somehow disabling or disorientating. I understand the sentiment we all, from time to time, will have encountered the kind of monolithic and teleological account of history, for example, that is recounted by Mr. D.C. in James Joyce's Ulysses, to which we may have been tempted to utter the famous response of Stephen Dedalus, history is a nightmare from which I'm trying to awake. And yes, there is some wisdom, surely, in the more modern work of David Reef in his suggestion that collective memory can over time become, as he put it, hatred's forge, rekindling old conflicts rather than healing them. Yet I do not think that we can gain anything from affecting any blanket amnesia towards the past, however comforting, or even if only for a time safe or attractive it may seem. It is only by acknowledging and sometimes revising, but always remembering in an inclusive way the events of our shared past, that we can begin to build a collective future. For the achievement of this, Paul Ricoeur advanced a position for what he called narrative hospitality, one which would open ourselves to the perspective, stories, memories and pains of the stranger, the other, even the enemy of yesterday, however dissonant it may seem. Professor Richard Carney has sought to develop and apply this perspective. History then obviously loses, one can even say is degraded, when it is sought to be deployed as propaganda, as it were, in a competitive battle of recalled grievances. If studied, however may I suggest, with ethical intent as to openness, not only to the foundation myths of the others in the discourse, the foundation myths of the others' life version, but also with understanding towards the possible sources of its inaccuracies, 
it can endow us not only with a deeper understanding of the present dispossession of things and the political, economic and social structures in which we are enmeshed and sometimes seek to escape but it can deepen our empathy for the perspective of others who are equally seeking to escape, which is so vital if we are to live together. It is a yield of such an ethical endeavour perspective that it opens windows to the possibilities of the future. As we would say in the Irish language. The opportunity to share efforts and the making of something new something that is not reducible to the past or the present. Already I realise how dependent we are for such an approach, for philosophical work, philosophical work that privileges engagement with our contemporary moral choices. And again, I so wish our universities will make the case for putting philosophy into its moment in the sun. We so badly need that. The imperative for an ethical core to such a project is all the more important when it is applied to public history and to the forms sought and given to intense acts of public remembering which we on these islands have been undertaking over the past six years as we have begun the process of commemorating the formative events of a century ago. Events which include the Ulster Covenant, the establishment of the Ulster and Irish Volunteers, the 1913 strike and lockout, the 1916 Easter Rising, the First World War, women's suffrage, the election of the First Tholian, the War of Independence, Partition and the Civil War. These events were formative, not only in the obvious sense of their consequences and the bringing about the division of Ireland into distinct jurisdictions, but also for their inspiring some of the great movements of thought and action, which have done so much to make our island a more emancipated place. An example would be the women's movement or the labour movement. Since I was inaugurated as president of Ireland, I have sought to place the action of remembering within an ethical context, and in doing so I have drawn on the works of not only of Ricoeur, who I have mentioned, but all, and of Richard Kearney, but also of Hannah Arendt. One of the obvious requirements of remembering ethically is the inclusion and recognition of those voices from the past that were and have been excluded, disenfranchised, marginalised, whether by virtue of their class, their race or their gender. That is why it was of such importance, for example, to restore the contribution of women of the revolutionary generation to their rightful place in history. This included women who sought full independence, some who sought it within home rule, some who were pacifists, but all sharing the same road towards the horizon that beckoned full equality for women. It is a journey that is, of course, not yet finished, the often repressive atmosphere of the new free state of the 1920s disappointed feminists from all parts of our island. And when feminism was and had been an all-island movement. That is why this year, as we mark the centenary of the achievement of the first step towards full women's suffrage on these islands, we recognise that the suffrage movement on this island owed its very existence to the tireless efforts of such as Isabella Todd, a Belfast-based Presbyterian, and Anna Haslam, a Quaker and businesswoman from Cork, both of whom never wavered in their support for the union between Britain and Ireland. Then, another example of plurality of method, as it were, are Constance and Eva Gobu, one president of the suffrage movement and the other secretary, united in the struggle for formal equality, but differing on what methods are right to be invoked in relation uh, to independence, and Eva being a major force in winning trade union rights for women in Manchester and throughout the United Kingdom. We have now on this island begun to address more comprehensively and I hope more reflectively than before, the experiences of these important figures from a century ago. 
figures that had been sidelined in the collective memory of the South and in the national historical narrative of the birth of the independent Irish state. In our more open approach to an empirically informed historiography, we've also embarked on a journey of acknowledging the experiences of those 200,000 men from all parts of Ireland, North and South, and from Irish communities across the world who were drawn into the horrors of the First World War. We have together recalled and remembered these men and their complex and sometimes contradictory political aspirations, and those who had no such aspirations, but were simply compelled by economic necessity, and in the case of the Dublin tenements, in the fallout from the lockout of 1913, simply driven by poverty to serve in the British Armed Forces. Though they shared the terrible experience of war in Europe, at Gallipoli, and in the Middle East, these Irishmen who returned from the First World War were treated very differently in what would become the Irish Free State than other similar returnees in Australia, Canada, New Zealand, or indeed in what would become Northern Ireland. There was an uncertainty regarding the place of the war and those who fought in it in our national history. And this was reflected in an attitude that enabled a near official amnesia towards the First World War. That has now changed, in part thanks to the work of historians again, including contributions by historians from this university, such as the late Professor Keith Jeffrey. In addition, many people on this island are now, through an examination of their family history, beginning to have a greater, and in the South sometimes too long delayed, insight into the experience of their grandparents and great-grandparents. As a consequence of that excavation of the personal past, there is now, I believe, a far greater understanding of the motivation of those who fought and died, as well as a heightened recognition of the lives, the promise and potential destroyed in the war. In restoring those sol soldiers to our public and collective memory, we have also gained a greater understanding and respect for the centrality of the experience of the 36th Ulster Division to public memory in the Unionist tradition. In doing so, we do not elide or avoid the legitimate and still important debates regarding the nature of a war in which a generation of the young of Europe was lost a war that I believe was in essence a collision of empires rather than a battle for small nations. But the important thing is that we are now addressing them and each other with the necessary respect and courtesies of discourse. And we are approaching all of the events that preceded all of this in the second half of the 19th century. As President of Ireland then, I do not see it as my purpose to present a particular vision of history or to assert any superiority of one singular narrative over any other, whether that be nationalist or unionist. On the contrary, when I visit Northern Ireland, as I did last weekend, I came hoping to practice and achieve the openness available to the human spirit to understand and respect, to the best of my abilities, the perspective of others. And while it may never be completely possible for any of us fully to free ourselves from our own previous experiences and inheritance of, of thought, my aim is simply to make a modest contribution to the transparency of purpose, the honesty of endeavour and the generosity toward other perspectives, which I believe are required of all of us if we are not to sacrifice the possibilities of a shared future. We need mind work now, work on language, sophisticated humanist reflection on how we can leap over barriers, real and unreal. The space for a reconciliation of historical perspective and of respect for one another's historical experience, both on this island and between Ireland and Britain, has been powerfully assisted in so many respects by the Good Friday Agreement itself in recognising the birthright of all those in Northern Ireland to identify themselves as Irish or British or both. The agreement has enabled a new respect for Irishness and Britishness, 
with all the complexity that that entails, reflective of both our shared history and shared future, and our actions past and present and future. Considering all that has gone before, the transformation of what had been the sometimes tense East-West relationship between the Irish and British governments to one characterised by its closeness now is remarkable. It has been accompanied by a deepening in what were already warm relationship between the peoples of Ireland and Britain. It is a measure of the political progress that we've made together in recent years that slowly and steadily we can now perform acts of public remembrance together. There is a growing recognition that we must help one another understand paths which we share, even if our perception of those paths frequently and legitimately differ. A most potent symbol of the transformation in our relationship was the state visit of Queen Elizabeth to Ireland in 2011 and the return state visit which I made at her invitation in 2014. There is no greater symbol of sovereign equality than the exchange of state visits, and there could have been no more important example of respecting all of the traditions on these islands than the joint laying of reeds for those who died for the cause of Irish freedom and for the Irish who died in British uniform. I think also of Queen Elizabeth's words in the Irish language which both signalled and evoked immense respect. It was a gesture which demonstrated the grace and generosity of spirit, so characteristic of Queen Elizabeth. But I suggest we shouldn't have been so surprised. For the first Queen Elizabeth spoke Irish, taking lessons from a young Irish aristocrat, uh, Christopher Nugent. I did look at the glossary she used in dealing with the O'Neills and the O'Donnells, and it had the important issues of land and other words like that in it, in three languages as she had them in that glossary. Indeed, the first Bible to be translated into the Irish language was prepared at the instigation of, of, that, of Queen Elizabeth I, and the Irish New Testament on, Chum, on Chumnanua was completed by William O'Gonnell, the Church of Ireland Archbishop of Toome, in the closing days of her reign in 1602. But then, from 1570 to the Second Vatican Council in 1962, the Tridentine Mass conducted through Latin was universal throughout the Catholic world. It is often forgotten then that it was only after the establishment of Presbyterianism in Ireland in 1642 that we can speak of religious services being conducted in Irish for the benefit of both Gaelic-speaking Scots and native Irish speakers. At one time it was conservatively estimated that one half of Ulster Presbyterians were Gaelic speakers. The work of Roger Blaney and Padraig O'Snodig has reminded us of the vital role that Presbyterianism played in sustaining the Irish language throughout our history. We have been interacting, as it were, in each other's linguistic spaces for quite a long time before the time of Shakespeare and his use of this conjunct of language in his historic history plays. I don't want to venture further in what I know is a rather sensitive issue, but I do want to acknowledge today <laughs> that the preservation of the Irish language was at one point, it had fa fallen to be the endeavour of only a dedicated few. And though that has changed, thankfully, Augustom Harvassostifushin, that so many of those few came from the Church of Ireland or dissenting traditions, including the first president of Ireland and Creven, Douglas the Hirtha. Dear friends, the last living veteran of the First World War, Florence Green, passed away in 2012. The last living veteran of our War of Independence died five years before that. As a consequence, those great struggles have now passed into the realm of that most amorphous and difficult of concepts, collective memory. The remembering is not an active practice in the sense of the singular. In fact, 
can remember have a plural, as David Reef would say. Yes, I'm very aware that the events of that dark period that is so often, and too simply, to tritely call the Troubles, a time in which terrible and heinous acts were inflicted and suffered by so many, remains very much a matter of personal memory. So it is with some trepidation that I offer my own thoughts on the necessary subject and of how we might approach the topic of forgiveness. And in doing so, I return again to the work of Hannah Arendt, a philosopher who wrote and thought deeply on its conceptual foundations and thus not on not just the possibilities but the difficulties involved in the transaction of forgiveness. Hannah Arendt wrote in The Human Condition that forgiveness is the necessary corrective for the inevitable damages that result from action. Forgiveness as an action arises, in the words of her doctoral student Elizabeth Young Brewer, to address the boundless happenings of the past. The purpose of forgiving as Hannah Arendt saw it, was to rob an event of the past of its capacity to deprive one of the realistic possibilities of the present or the imaginative possibilities of the future. As we would say now. For Hannah Arendt, forgiveness was not an abstract act summoned up by an individual to address a particular wrong, but a new relationship summoned up by an individual a new relationship forged between forgiven and forgiver, one in which new abuses of power should not be allowed to emerge, in which one would claim it as a tool of the other. Forgiveness, then, plays a central and necessary part in reconciliation. I recognise that it's very easy for me to say that, and some are asked to pay a very high price when they're asked, when they're called to forgive. Forgive a great heart that cannot be expelled from their memory. But their achievement, if they do so, is all the greater. I recall reading the pragmatic, as it were, thoughts of Bishop Desmond Tutu, who has reflected deeply on the nature of forgiveness, and in particular on its potential to free the individual from the confines of past hurt. He said... Without forgiveness, we remain tethered to the person who harmed us. We are bound with chains of bitterness, tied, tied together, trapped. Until we can forgive the person who harmed us, that person will hold the keys to our happiness. That person will be our jailer. When we forgive, we take back control of our own fate and our feelings. We become our own liberators. Forgiveness, in other words, is the best form of self-interest. This is true both spiritually and scientifically. We don't forgive to help the other person. We don't forgive for others. We forgive for ourselves. Hence, I have called this statement of Bishop Tutu's pragmatic. If this is true for the individual, then, perhaps it is also true or could be true for societies. And this, of course, was at the centre of Bishop Tutu's thinking in his thoughts as to how to construct a decent future for the people of South Africa following the years of brutality and atrocities. Forgiveness, of course, cannot occur without dealing with this issue of the commitment to remember, as difficult as it may be, the actions of the past. I therefore can welcome the launch earlier this month of the British government's consultation on addressing the legacy of Northern Ireland's past. The full implementation of the Stormont House Agreement, of which the consultation forms part, will be an important step towards ongoing reconciliation in Northern Ireland. Four years ago at this university, I spoke not only of remembering, forgiving and forgetting, but of imagining, for it is in imagining a shared future released from, though not forgetting past memories, and from seemingly insurmountable present challenges, that the energy on Fwinyev 
can be found to build a bridge to the future. The vision of the future envisioned by the Good Friday Agreement, a vision of the future as a space to be shared, does not present, as I believe, with an impossible task. In this year anniversary year, we rightly look back and celebrate the immense success which the agreement represented. It is the achievement, as you have heard, of successive governments in London and Dublin, of our support of friends in the European Union and the United States. But above all, it is a testament to the moral courage and resilience of the people of Northern Ireland, including their political leaders, who can proudly claim to have created one of the most successful peace processes in recent history, a claim validated by public opinion around the world, even if it is sometimes doubted closer home. Let us also recognise that the Good Friday Agreement is a present reality and that implementing it remains a work in progress. Indeed, as Northern Ireland continues to operate without an executive, in some respects, the work has been stalled. It is therefore essential that we remind ourselves and reaffirm that the Good Friday Agreement, with all its imperfections and creativity, represents the best hope for all of our people north and south. In this century, our island and our planet will be summoned to confront great challenges, where words will have to be turned into actions. The outlines of those challenges are discernible to us today. The necessity to achieve just and sustainable development, the moral imperative to welcome the ever greater numbers fleeing war, famine, persecution, natural disasters. The need to oppose unequivocally the contemporary manifestations of racism and xenophobia. And above all, we must work together on the mitigation of the potentially catastrophic effects of climate change. None of us can be indifferent to the future. These challenges to which I've made reference demand action in the public realm from all of us, a public realm which the Good Friday Agreement has uniquely created for this whole island. That is why it's now important to find urgent, to find a way in Dublin and London, but above all here in Northern Ireland, to move away from the hard shoulder where the implementation of the Good Friday Agreement presently finds itself, and to start moving together again along our shared journey, and to do so with generosity. Arlene Foster has, I believe, recognised this when she said, given the size of Northern Ireland and the scale of challenges we face, we will only succeed if we move forward together. So despite the not inconsiderable challenges and distractions, I remain optimistic that we can all recommit ourselves without any fear but with the greatest of hopes to the principles that lie at the core of the Good Friday Agreement. The communities in Northern Ireland have shown the world in the past that working together, they can measure up to any order, however tall, and burdened with complexity, they can do so even better. There is one challenge that I have omitted so far, and it is one that I have no wish to avoid addressing in our present circumstances, and that is concerning the decision of the United Kingdom to exit the European Union. Although this is a process that did not originate on our island, the majority of people in Northern Ireland did not favour the decision, it has thrown up profound and testing questions in the context of the interests, identity and aspirations on this island. And I would be dishonest if I didn't express great regret at the decision of the British people in 2016. However, I wish to emphasise today that irrespective of the manner in which the challenge of Brexit is resolved, it will be more essential than ever in the years ahead to work to maintain the new and deep friendships which have been developed between Britain and Ireland and between North and South in the context of both our existing shared membership of the European Union and of the peace process. I want to particularly emphasise just one point regarding Brexit because it is a point which is sometimes misunderstood or misrepresented. In the Brexit negotiations, the core aim of the Irish government relating to relationships on this island a name which I share, is to preserve the provisions and principles of the Good Friday Agreement. 
This is not a straightforward task because the Brexit process necessarily, in some respects, unpicks what was painstakingly woven together. My point is simply to emphasise the importance of manifesting and acknowledging good faith on this sensitive question. Dear friends, Marfuckle Square, last month I had the honour of addressing the United Nations General Assembly of which Harry Halkery was a former president. The occasion was a high-level meeting on peace building and sustaining peace, part of an effort to bring together the United Nations and its member states to work coherently across the three pillars upon which the action of the United Nations is organised, peace and security, human rights and development. And I spoke of the importance of not confining normative thinking to the General Assembly, of which Harry Halkery was a former distinguished president, and, as it were, resiling to accepting that real and dangerous work can take place in the Security Council. The reports produced in the weeks and months before that meeting I attended were sobering. A recent joint report prepared by the World Bank and the United Nations indicated that in 2016, more countries experienced violent conflict than at any time in the past 30 years, while reported battle-related deaths in 2016 were 10 times higher than in 2005. It is a profound condemnation of what humanity has made of our legacies of culture, reason, ethics, belief systems, scholarship, that we now live in a world that is home yet again to so much war, at a time when we have in our hands the power to abolish all forms of human poverty. We continue to share a planet with hundreds of millions of people who are every day deprived of their most fundamental economic and social rights. Science and technology and our capacity for innovation and creativity continue to be used to fan the flames of conflict rather than directed to the purposes of peace. It is not surprising, then, that many of those attending that meeting in New York were deeply pessimistic. There was a feeling that the multilateral system itself was under attack, that a diplomacy of the common good, the kind of patient and generous diplomacy practised by Harry Halkre, was being replaced by a diplomacy of transaction of interests among the powerful, one based not on deliberation, but on a very narrow conception of self-interest, and that badly and dangerously defined. At that meeting, I spoke not only of our global challenges, but of the success represented by the Good Friday Agreement and the contribution made by the two governments involved in the negotiations, the importance of sustained financing for peace-building activities, and the role of the European Union and the United States. Above all, I paid tribute to the steady and courageous activism of civic organisations campaigning for a more just and peaceful society, many of which, as we know, were led by women. Our peace process and the Good Friday Agreement remain extraordinary examples to the world that peace can be built and that it can, with the necessary ethical intent and purpose, be sustained. We have a responsibility to ourselves and to others then, to continue that effort here on this island, to sustain British-Irish relations, and to continue to promote the lessons of the peace process, that international agreements with all their imperfections must be respected, that the most important step towards defending our own interests is to be sensitive to the interests of others, that there can be no respect of identity or aspirations which is not mutual, that complexity in international affairs is inevitable and to be celebrated, not disdained. And that compromise, when forged through deliberation in the public sphere, is a virtue, not a vice. Being open to imagining, achieving the ethical purpose of remembering, taking the risks of forgiving, leads, I believe, to a virtuous discourse that for future generations enjoying peace together will deserve to be in time celebrated and remembered. Mila Buitlis, thank you.